Welcome to part four of the Walden Six, the forgotten forerunners of the Protestant Reformation. Hi, I'm Mike Alpine. This program is dedicated to the undoubtable facts of the antiquity of the Walden Six. We'll look at the apostolic origin of the Walden Six and how it goes all the way back to the apostles. Then we'll look at the pure word of God that was kept safe during the Dark Ages from 538 to 1798 and then was given to the Protestant Reformation. And then we'll look at the Sabbath and how they kept it pure of old. But first we're going to look at Shan Ferran and how it applies to the Protestant Reformation. Wow, that was a really good walk that we had up here. And it's a really comfortable place to sit for a little bit. You know, you've, you've showed us and told us a lot of information uh, this week. And uh, it, it's interesting that um, I understand that you keep the Sabbath as a Waldensian pastor. Es muy interesante saber que como un pastor valdense también es observador del sábado. And I was just wondering, would you be interested in sharing a little bit about um, why you keep the Sabbath and and uh, and maybe you can explain to us a little bit why the Waldenses are are no longer keeping the Sabbath. Quizás en eh, forma breve nos puede explicar cómo llegó al conocimiento de la observancia del sábado y por qué hoy día la, los valdenses no guardan el sábado. Bueno, eh, tradicionalmente eh, nosotros sabemos que eh, los valdenses en el periodo medieval eh, observaban el sábado. Traditionally, we know that the Waldenses during the Middle Ages were Sabbath keepers. Era una práctica eh, normal, sin, sin mayores eh, preguntas o eh, o, o cuestionamientos teológicos. El sábado era el, el día normal de, de reposo. Yeah, it was normal for them to keep the Sabbath. There was no other way. I mean, everybody has been keeping the Sabbath for ages. Hay, muchas, hay muchos testimonios que son básicamente um, testimonios mudos, sin declaraciones eh, específicas, pero que nos dan a entender este tipo de, de, de costumbres. There are many testimonies. Mm -hmm. that, tell, that tell us that they were Sabbath keepers, even though they are not, doc they are not documented. But the testimonies of the people are here for us to know. As we were researching the history of the Sabbath among the Waldenses of today, we came to this church in Perino. Above this door is a very old symbol of the Waldensian faith. While we were looking around, an old caretaker from the church was kind enough to show us into the church. With a very old key, he opened the metal doors and showed us inside. After opening the inside doors into the temple, the first thing we saw was this beautiful light resting upon this ancient Bible. While our guide showed us around, I thought it would be a good opportunity to ask him if he heard about the Sabbath in Waldensian history. Well, we're here at a Waldensian church, and um, I met this wonderful man at, at the church here. He's one of the caretakers, and uh, his name is Arturo. Arturo. And I had a question for him, if you could ask him, that I have some very old books. And they say that the Waldenses kept the Sabbath on the on Saturday. And I was wondering if he ever heard anything like that. Dice io a casa ho dei libri vecchi di cento anni e in uno di essi è scritto che i Valdesi una volta osservavano il sabato. Devo solo chiederle se ha mai sentito di questo. Sì, l'ho sentito, ma non c'è nessun. Yes, I heard about it, but I'm not sure. La fonte non è giusta, perché alle volte vado con uno e mi dice una cosa e vado con un altro. I'm not sure that the source is reliable, because I've heard different things from different people. Allora non si può dire così. 
I cannot say it was like this. Okay, but there is, surety. but there still is talk around the people about some of these things. Ma lui chiede che però comunque è una, è una diceria che comunque gira tra le persone che è stato sì. così. Girata, girata, come so tempo, ma adesso non più. Yes, it was at that time. And yeah, people were saying this not anymore today. Yeah, not today. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Grazie molto. Appreciate, appreciate the tour. Si che ha apprezzato il giro della chiesa. Era básicamente la, eh, la costumbre, la observancia eh, hecha por Pedro Valdo mismo. Ok. Eh, eh, Peter Valdo was also a Sabbath keeper. Oh, he was. Uh, yes. So he, it was normal for the people to continue keeping the Sabbath, oh. even though he came later, but they were uh -huh. already keeping the Sabbath. Amazing. Y es, es un secreto revelado en, en, en algunos aspectos, por ejemplo, en un modo muy eh, suspicaz, en, eh, en el monumento a la Reforma en la ciudad de Bonds. Okay, there's a monument to the Reformation in the city of Bonn. And there, uh, it's a secret in a way, but it's not a secret in another way. There's something that tells us about the Sabbath. Oh. Si nosotros vamos a la ciudad de Bonn, donde fue la dieta de Bonn, donde Lutero se presentó delante del emperador, allí hay un monumento de Lutero y de los grandes reformadores, entre ellos Baldo. Okay, if we go to the city of Worm in, in Germany, yeah. that's where Luther went before the emperor, the Diet of Worm, and also it's a monument to many reformers, including Peter Waldo. Pedro Waldo está allí en, en en este monumento al, uh, por debajo de, de, de Lutero y eh, si nosotros observamos Baldo está sentado en esta posición en la que estoy yo Ok, there we see Luther in the same monument and uh -huh. then on, underneath is Peter Waldo really? and he's sitting like he's sitting Y en el monumento nosotros vemos el calzado de Baldo Then we see his shoe Que es una sandalia eh, atada con eh, un, uh, un lazo. So you have a sandal and, uh -huh. and it goes all the way up to here tied with shoelaces. Y está deliberadamente levantada para que se vea este tipo de calzado. And it's, uh, the monument it was done that way so people could see his shoes. Eso es un testimonio histórico de que corresponde a los llamados anabaptis. Era un término antiguo latín. It was an old Latin word. Que eran los cristianos que observaban el sábado. That were the Christians that were Sabbath keepers. Y entre ellos se identificaban por el modo del calzado y la ligadura que llevaban. And one way to, to show that you were a Sabbath keeper then was the sandal that they used to wear. Oh. O sea que Baldo usaba este tipo de, uh, de, de sandalia porque era la costumbre uh, para decir uh, yo soy un cristiano pero observo el sábado. So Waldo wore that kind of sandal and in a way he was telling the people I'm a Sabbath keeper as well I'm a, I'm a Christian. Okay, and, and, and there's quite a bit of discussion about these Sabato sandals. Uh, even in America a lot of people are discussing this, that are studying the subject. Okay. Aún hoy día en Estados Unidos hay mucha gente que comienza a darse cuenta que había un zapato especial o sandalias que usaban ellos. And some people are saying that um, the word sabata is, is talking about a sandal. Other people say it's talking about the Sabbath. But what you're saying it means is the, the sandal was a symbol of them keeping the Sabbath. Eh, mucha gente comienza a deliberar. Bueno, la palabra zapato quizá tenga una relación con sábado o no. Algunos dicen que sí, otros dicen que no. Eh, pero es interesante lo, lo que uh -huh. está mencionando cómo usaban ciertas sandalias que identificaban que también eran cristianos y observadores del sábado. Exacto, era un, un modo de testimonio mudo porque en el medioevo había necesariamente que transmitir la fe en usos y costumbres. It was a silent witness mm. because during the Middle Ages it was dangerous to express uh, your belief. However, okay. 
by keeping silent, by showing something different, uh -huh. people knew right away that you were a Sabbath keeper. Amen. Es básicamente la misma técnica de los cristianos de la iglesia primitiva en, en Roma, con, con eh, la, la figura del pez y, y demás. The same technique that the uh, apostolic church used, having a fish. Uh, At the symbol okay. of the fish, was telling the people, I'm a Christian. And so they were using the sandals as a symbol that they were Christians right. and keeping the Sabbath. Right. Wonderful. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, Shan Ferran. Poquito en cuanto a Shan Ferran. Bueno, con respecto a Shan Ferran fue un momento que dividió la historia valdense en en dos grandes periodos. That that event divided the Valdensian history in two periods. Okay. Desde el inicio del siglo XII con Pedro Valdo hasta 1532, eso es el periodo medieval. Okay, from the 12th century with Pedro Valdo all the way to the 16th century, that's the Middle Age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. En ese periodo es, es, el, es la gran expansión de los pobres de León. That time is with the poor from Lyons mm -hmm. spread out across Italy. Okay. Pero es una predicación clandestina. But it was clandestine. Chanforan ah. significa nosotros nos eh, declaramos al mundo que existimos y no, eh, eh, adherimos a la reforma que en Europa se está eh, llevando a cabo. Chanforan was the moment when they said to the world, here we are, we're also a Christian group and we are uniting with the reformation movement right now. Leaving Torpeliche, we climb up the Angrana Valley to the famous location of Chanferan. Arriving to our location, we come to a path that is paved and that leads to a monument. This Waldensee Valley is a perfect place for a large assembly, and not to mention the beautiful scenery of this place. As Hector continues to walk to the monument, we come to the steps that lead to a plot that is surrounded with a hedge of green. It was in this place in 1532 that the Waldenses met with Protestant representatives. At this meeting, Wiley tells us that the Protestant reformers lovingly chastised some of the Waldenses for their recent compromise with the Papists so they would not be persecuted. But the reformers were so glad to find a people that had the pure word of God. Okay, we are here in Chanferran, uh, Chonfron is uh, the French how they say it, and this is a very interesting place because something amazing happened here, but there's some good news that took place here and there's some bad news that took place here. Um, we know that this was the first ecumenical meeting that took place before the Protestant Reformation got going uh, in a more faster and sped up way. So, so Hector, what, is, what was the bad news? Well, the bad news is that the reformers and the Waldensians, they came together mm -hmm. in September of 1532. Mm -hmm. And they met here for six days. And uh, the purpose of the meeting was to unite the two groups into one. Okay. So that was, that was good in a way, but it was not good in another way. Because when you come together with other groups that have different ideas, then you compromise. Uh -huh. That means you give something and you lose something. It's a give and take situation, and that's the sad news that what that, that happened here almost 500 years ago. Okay, so f from during the latter parts of the persecution that was happening to the Waldenses, they were under tremendous attack for so many years that some of them were starting to get wore down, and they were starting to even get licenses from the papacy that they wouldn't be molested as they went through their travels and stuff as long as they went to mass and and they and they prayed to the saints or whatever as long as they had that document from the papacy they were able to move about without being molested and even though they they didn't believe in it but when you do something like that you kind of end up giving up something your heart starts getting eroded uh, when you start giving those things up so when they come so when they met with here at Schoenfrong to meet up with the Protestants, they already were kind of dumbed down uh, in their doctrines. Is right. that correct? Yes, that's, that's what I understand that happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they came from different parts of Europe, and the Waldensians, they were here, they met, and they compromised. 
Okay. Uh, so that's the bad news. En septiembre de 1532, durante una semana, todos los grandes líderes valdenses se reunieron en una gran asamblea. September 1532, all the major Valdensian leaders came together in an assembly. Se habló, se discutió acaloradamente. They talked, they debated back and forth. Había una, un, un sector de, de la población valdense que no estaba convencida en adherir a la reforma calvinista o a la reforma luterana. No estaba convencida. Some, some people in the Valdensian community were not willing to join with the reformation. Algunos de ellos habían incluso ido a encontrarse con los hermanos de Moravia, con los Husitas. Some of them have even gone to see the Moravian or the Husites, oh, brothers. Okay. Y ellos le habían dicho, no, no se junten, no adhieran a la reforma. And the Moravians told the Valdense, don't join the reformation. El pueblo valdense siempre ha tomado decisiones importantes de una manera uh, democrática. Hmm. So the Valdense people always has make a decision by taking the account everybody's points. Yeah. La autoridad es espiritual y re reside en la asamblea de los creyentes. So the authority comes from heaven and then everyone is, is, is there to, to, to voice his opinion. Mm. Y en esa asamblea por mayoría se decide de adherir a la reforma de Calvino. So in, in, in that event the majority decided to join with Calvin. Oh. Eso comportó que el, el, el mundo valdense se transformara ya no en, en un movimiento clandestino, sino en una iglesia que le dice al mundo, que le dice a Francia, que le dice a Saboya, nosotros estamos aquí. From that moment on, the Waldensian people became a church. And it was telling the entire world, France, Savoy, that we are here. Esto comportó dos cosas. That have two things that were important. Muy importantes. Una fue la consecuencia doctrinal, teológica. One was an impact on the theology of the leaves of the Waldens. They adopted the thinking of Calvin. Renunciando algunas costumbres antiguas entre ellas la observancia del sábado. Putting aside some of the old traditions, mm. like Sabbath, for mm. Pero esto no lo, van a, no lo vamos a encontrar escrito explícitamente en la declaración de Jean Paul. However, we're not going to find this written down in the final declaration that came out of that event. Mm -hmm. Porque no era, uh, no, no era éticamente correcto. Because it was not ethically right to do that. La Asamblea de Chanforán fue, fue revisionada y aceptada por el Sínodo del 1533, un año posterior. A year later, there was another assembly came together and the document that came out of the uh, Chanforán event mm -hmm. was once again ratified a year later. Okay, so there's two documents, the first the original and then it was ratified the second time in that document. Que hay como dos documentos, el original y uno que fue ratificado en Sí. Uh, la consecuencia teológica espiritual fue precisamente nosotros adoptamos un modo de fe eh, que viene, viene sugerido e impuesto desde Ginebra y renunciamos a algunas cosas del pasado. Okay. We are now adopting the thinking, the theological thinking of Ginebra mm -hmm. with Calvin and then we're willing to put aside some of the things that we have done in the past. Entonces creemos eh, más por tradición oral que escrita. So now we believe more for oral tradition than written tradition. In the but this is a lesson for us in our learning. Of course. That today now it's our turn. You know, as, as the papacy was rising and the people saw the compromise, people stood up against it, which Walden Seas were one of those groups. And, and they weren't going to compromise. But a lot of them, a lot of other people did compromise during that time. So now that history is happening all over again, we see we see paganistic things coming into the church, from the music and the theology, uh, the Gnostic gospels and these type of things coming into the even to our own ranks. And the thing is, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to compromise and go to ecumenical meetings and give up some of the truths that we hold true to, or are we going to stand firm, 
even if it costs everything that we have. Well, the bad news is that we have already compromised a lot. Okay. The good news is that by the grace of God, we can recover okay. the ground that we have lost. Okay. If we are willing to be faithful to God, God will bless us again. It's not going to be easy, uh -huh. but it's possible by the grace of God. Okay, so what we're seeing now, we're seeing God is putting a, together a little army, and it's growing and growing. And we're told in, in spirit of prophecy that God's people are going to march in perfect order, not one person breaking line. Everybody will be the same truth, the same doctrine, and we're going to march together uh, in love. For even for our enemies, we need to have oh, that, that incredible love that we don't we don't preach the gospel like the devil. <laughs> That's right. But we 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 love our enemies and we do good to them that persecute us. This yeah. is true Christianity, uncompromised Christianity. It is. So we have to love our enemies. However, we cannot compromise too. Mm -hmm. um, if we do, we lose. <laughs> uh, the only ones that will lose is those who are willing to compromise. <clears throat> yeah. So Ron, what was the good news? I mean, God, he, he seems to always work with our failures. He loves us a lot and he is trying to still work even with us today. He's not going to give up on his church. So what What was the, some of the good things that took place here at Chompa? Well, I, I also wanted to tie into something he just said. Okay. And that is, uh, I heard somebody recently say, it's better to be divided by truth than united by error or oh. heresy. So I think that we can be, we need to be in the world, but not of the world. Amen. That's what Jesus said. And so, but uh, when th there were preliminary meetings that happened before they actually came here, this was kind of the culmination. But there were some scouts that the Waldens sent over to Europe, across the mountains to Switzerland and different places. And they heard, they, they were surprised. They thought for a long time, uh, sort of like was it Elijah that he thought he was the only one, yeah. you know? And so the Wallensees for many years they thought that they were probably the only ones. Uh -huh. They they were they met with so much persecution and so much hardship and they saw a compromise everywhere. And so they when they heard that there was something going on in Europe, uh, they uh, sent some uh, ambassadors. Actually, I think one of them was killed on the way back. I don't remember the exact story, but the two of them went over and went on the way back, one of them was killed. But finally, they decided uh, to have this meeting. And I'm not sure, but I think William Farrell was actually here. Oh, amazing. Uh, in, in representing some of the uh, Calvin and some of the others that didn't come. But, uh -huh. but there were a lot of people that met here. And uh, you can just look around here and see there's plenty of room for lots of people. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, one of the things that they were concerned uh, that they would have to give up their beliefs. Mm -hmm. But like a lot of things, you know, a lot of times today, people say, oh no, you don't have to give up anything. Just join us and we'll all be one church and we'll just have one Jesus and we won't have any doctrine. Mm -hmm. They were assured that they wouldn't have to give up anything. And, but one of the things that the uh, Reformation really wanted was they wanted that Waldensian Bible. Uh -huh. They wanted a pure Waldensian Bible. And so uh, Calvin's relative, uh, Pierre Olivetan, promised that he would that he would uh, get this Bible for him. And uh, now he was a relative. I think he was either a cousin, or some people uh -huh. think it was a nephew or a cousin. I don't know if we know for sure, but he was a relative of of Calvin. In fact, he was in Paris. Uh, he and Calvin had a lot of uh, overnight days together where they argued almost all night mm -hmm. uh, and finally uh, Pierre Levitin convinced Calvin to, to uh, believe the pure, the pure gospel mm. and uh, so they uh, he was an incredible scholar as well I believe that he knew Erasmus so Ron what about Bible manuscripts what is what can we learn from your historical evidence here about Bible manuscripts so as we know uh, there are basically two conflicting philosophies mm -hmm. in the world. One is the true uh, Church of God, uh, which follows the Bible and the apostolic teachings. And then there's the uh, false uh, church, which originated in, in Alexandria and Carthage in Northern Africa. Right. Right. And so in... in uh, 
in the, the importance of the antiquity of the Waldenses is, first of all, our, our theory is, and it's amazing you came up with the theory, I did, came up with it before we even met each other, mm -hmm. and that's why kind of we came together because we both had this mutual interest in the Waldenses, but the, the uh, theory is, is that the, uh, the, the way that Jesus' statement to Peter, that upon this rock I will build my church, that is taken by the the Roman Catholic Church as giving the keys to Peter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, even though a few verses later in the same chapter, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. So mm -hmm. it'd be kind of hard to build your church on, on Satan if you're telling him to get behind you. But nevertheless, we understand as Protestants, we understand that, that he said, you are Peter, but upon this rock, and we know Peter himself said that this rock is Christ. The foundational rock is Christ. And Petra the, and Petros. Honey. Yeah, and the whole Old Testament talks about the, the cornerstone. Mm -hmm. And so their their whole theory is, is that their church is the true church, the only church, because it goes all the way back to the apostles. However, uh, there was another group of people that, were, that came down from the apostles uh, and they went all over the world from Antioch. Mm -hmm. So you had two streams of Christianity starting at the same time. The, the one stream, and Paul even talks about it, you know, he says that there's another uh, power that's, that's coming in and there's a falling away and people, men from your own own uh, group are going to uh, another depart, gospel. depart, another yeah. gospel. Yeah. And so at that same time in Antioch, the Bible says that's where they were first called Christians in Syria. And uh, so they, they were uh, preaching the true, pure gospel. And they believed that they came, that their gospel came directly from Jesus and their teachings proved it. Whereas the, the church that said they came from Peter, they were completely a uh, different type of gospel. And in fact, they were mixing in, you know, the church fathers were mixing in all kinds of pagan beliefs. And so you had these two conflicting uh, beliefs. And so, that the uh, Roman Catholic Church was sending missionaries all over the world trying to convert people to their philosophy of religion and at the same time the apostles we know some of them went to China some went to India right. you know and some went to different parts of Asia and uh, Turkey especially there a lot of a lot of uh, the work was done there and so they believed that they came all the way from from uh, the apostle apostolic succession but right. they didn't claim it but they their their teachings were more in line with proving it so the Waldenses they were being persecuted wherever they went hmm. by the other church of the day which was in very high power the emperors were involved the kings were involved and uh, it was not a fun time to be alive if you didn't go along with the state religion but they were being persecuted because they claimed that their truths came all the way from the apostles. Mm. And so, uh, so basically there's been a lot of controversy about uh, why were the Waldenses persecuted so much and several reasons. One of them is because they didn't accept Jerome's Latin Vulgate version mm -hmm. of the Bible, of the scriptures, uh, which was a corrupt version, uh, it, although it was pronounced perfect and flawless by the Pope at that mm -hmm. time, who paid him a lot of money to do this. Uh, he was a brilliant man, incidentally, and he translated the scriptures into Latin. And uh, it was called Jerome's Latin mm -hmm. version, Vulgate meaning for the common people. Right. But he, uh, even though the Pope pronounced it as perfect, he found all kinds of errors in it, and he admitted that it was full of all kinds of mistakes, and so he corrected it. He kept correcting it for I don't know how many editions, mm -hmm. several editions. But the Waldenses didn't accept that, and they had their early uh, Latin Bibles. Yeah. And then, as you know, at the time of uh, uh, 1532, when uh, the Waldenses joined the Reformation, uh, John Calvin's cousin, we think it was his cousin, at least a relative, he uh, was... It says a close relative, so in the ancient yeah, manuscripts say yeah, that. Yeah, most of them so say cousin. So we can cousin, figure that would be yeah, a cousin, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, uh, he he translated the Bible into French, hmm. and it was the first French Bible directly into French, from the Greek, I believe. And so anyway, um, 
this rendered them all the more hated by the, the Catholic Church because mm -hmm. it, uh, they were, they were uh, following the Bible and not the corrupt version. Hmm. And, and we're told that they had the pure word of God. The Great Controversy says they had the pure word of God unadulterated. There, this this uh, Bible version was in their in the Ramat language to start with manuscript form. I actually have a uh, Waldensian Bible. Most of them I heard over there. They liked little Bibles. Yeah. Uh, I have a great big huge Bible. It was a parlor Bible by an English nobleman in the 1800s. I have it at home. I have to have a. Uh, it, it's heavy to carry. Yeah. 25 pounds. Good Englishman. <laughs> yeah. But those parlor Bibles, they never were read. They just sat on the, on yeah. the table, just and they'd Look. write when they got married, when they died, and things like that. Right. Found but the, the Wallenses, they wanted small Bibles and they could keep them hidden. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they just had little portions of scripture that they would memorize. And, and so this, this Bible was given to me on our last trip over there. And it is basically a, a, uh, pretty much comes down from Pierre Olive Eaton's Bible, but uh, mm -hmm. It's by J. F. Osterwald, and uh, he. This is 1897, but it's almost identical to the Pierre Olive Eaton Bible, and it's in French. So this is. Uh, it's seen some better days. It's kind of warped, but I love this little Bible because this is the way they really lived by the Bible. And uh, and, and so so basically, uh, they contributed a huge contribution. But in in return, like Hector said, I think there was some compromise that had to be done. And uh, like we were talking earlier today, uh, when we came up from the cave, uh, God doesn't always give all the light to one person. Mm -hmm. Even today, He doesn't give all the light to one person. It's progressive. It's progressive. And so, all the way from John Wycliffe, you know, he translated the Bible, but he had to use the Jerome's corrupt Latin mm -hmm. Vulgate translation. Even Jerome himself said it was full of errors. Mm -hmm. He kept revising it and revising it. But that's the only one that was available for Wycliffe. Mm -hmm. So he was given light and, and it was a very, very bright light to give a Bible, at least oh, a yeah. Bible to the English right. people. And even though most people couldn't afford it because it was handwritten and mm -hmm. took the, the wages of about one year's earning just to buy right. a handwritten Bible. So. But then the other uh, uh, reformers came along and they, they were given light. Mm -hmm. You know, Martin Luther was, was given light about the justification by faith, and Zwingli was given the light about, about the uh, primacy of the Bible and the uh, sola scriptura, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, so basically, uh, I think that together there was some, comp there, there was some compromise. And it wasn't all bad. Mm -hmm. It wasn't bad, but I think that they've kind of forgot there, uh, was it in Peter, where it says, you're a chosen generation, sure, yeah. a peculiar people, a royal well, there's priesthood. There's and there's so there's yeah. I think that it's hard today. No one wants to stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah. I, I know a lot of uh, Christians that belong to my uh, church, you know, the Seventh-day Adventist church, and they don't want to be, uh, they don't want to stick out like a sore thumb. You know, they don't want to be different, especially young people. They, they don't want to be, uh, weird, you know, and and yet the Bible says that we have to be peculiar, and so the Walden we need to be a fool for Christ. Even as Paul yeah, says. yeah, and and the Waldenses were very peculiar. Mm -hmm. They had the pure word of God. They for many years they actually kept the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Many of them did, and we have good documentation that's been coming out more and more lately on that. Yeah. Now our last subject, we're going to talk about the Sabbath and its origin, and with the Waldenses, of course. And, and how it applies also to our time and how to be faithful. I mean, we can learn a lot from the Wolvensees how to be faithful. And so, what do you have on that? Now, uh, Adam Blair, uh, he has a, a, a really good uh, two volume uh, book here. And uh, this book was uh, falling apart, but it's one of my most valuable books in my library, History of the Wolvensees. It's in uh, 15, 38, 33, and uh, he says here on page 220, there is an exposition of the Apostles' Creed by the Waldenses in which they quote 1 John 4, 7 in defense of the Trinity, and they defend all the doctrines now found in that summary, except descending into hell and believing in the Holy Catholic Church. Among the documents we have by the same people an explanation of the Ten Commandments dated by Boyer 1120. And here's what it says. It contains a compend or a summary of Christian morality. 
supreme love to God is enforced, and recourse to the influence of the planets and to sorcerers is condemned. Mm. The evil of worshiping God by images and idols is pointed out. A solemn oath to confirm anything doubtful is admitted, but profane swearing is forbidden. Observation of the Sabbath, there it is. So they're commandment keeping people here. <laughs> by ceasing from worldly labors mm -hmm. and from sin, by good works and by promoting the edification of the soul through prayer and hearing the word is enjoined. Then it goes on, the fifth, sixth, and seventh commandments are explained in the ordinary way. On the eighth precept, not only the theft, but fraud, coining, base money, so gambling for gain, trifling away time, false witnessing, covetousness. So the, they, they believed in the Ten Commandments, yeah. including the Sabbath. So, so that, was, that was kind of interesting. So here's another um, quotation, and uh, this is from Duquesne, Glossarium Media in Infime Latininatus, article Sabatati. And the heretics at that time, I'm just saying before I read the quotation, the heretics uh, were expelled, uh, the Waldenses in Aragon in Spain were, were called in Sabati. Yeah. And uh, these Sabbath keepers in Spain were actually Waldenses. They went all over the world. They were in England and everywhere. This is proved by a statement by Bernard Gee, the famous program builder of the Inquisition. And here's what he says. He said that in Sabati was the name given to the boudoir. There is much evidence that these Sabbath keepers were interchangeably called Waldenses and Insabati. Right. So the fact that clear up into the year 1194 the Waldenses were keeping the Sabbath in Spain is important. This late in the Middle Ages, the Sabbath was still being observed. Yeah. The fact that papal authorities in Germany, Italy, and France at about the same time as the decree of King Alphonse of Aragon issued his decree in 1194 uh, were putting forth their writings against the Sabatati or the Insabati shows how many widespread were the Waldenses. In the records of the Inquisition, there are lots of references to heretics called by the name of Sabatate or Insabatati. Now, some people yeah. have, have misunderstood that term and they think that they were against the Sabbath. The Sabbath. Yeah. But, uh, but at that time, Rome was calling Sunday Sabbath, and exactly. so they were, that's why they were called Sabbate or in Sabbate because it depends on how you were looking at it, so you have to read it in the context. Now check this quotation, this is really good, and I don't have the book, but mm -hmm. it's quoted by Dr. Jacob Gretzer in Opera Omnia, volume 12, page 2, part 2, page 11. It says, the sects which kept the seventh day of Sabbath were called Sabbati, Sabbata, and in Sabbati. Here's the quote. They were first called in Sabati not because they were circumcised, but because they kept Sabbath according to the Jewish law. I yeah. mean, they're, don't let anybody tell you that in Sabati means anything else. Yeah. It's because they were Sabbath keepers. And just for the viewer's sake, uh, we have to realize also that the Sabbath was created before there was a Jew. So the Jews were just following God's precepts from the very beginning yeah, from Eden. Exactly. So, now here's, a, here's another really interesting thing, and, and I can't read uh, the reference because it's in German. Yeah. I'm sorry, it's on page, book 2, pages 3 and 31, and I can't yeah. even begin to pronounce it. It's a big, yeah. long German name for the book. But it says, A Waldensian prisoner, probably in Friedberg, Germany, was obviously a Sabbath keeper. Mm. Her name was Barbara von Thies. And here's coding. Testified that on the last St. Michael's Day concerning confession, as it is administered by the priest, she has nothing to do with it. As to that which has to do with the Virgin Mary, on that she has nothing to do answer. Concerning Sunday and feast days, she says, The Lord God commanded us to rest on the seventh day. Yeah. And with that I let it be. With God's help and His grace, we all would stand by and die in the faith, for it is the right faith and the right way to die. Right way in Christ. Yeah. So I mean, you know, a lot of Waldensian uh, being, this is in her trial, mm -hmm. and she was testifying to the Seventh-day Sabbath. Well, we're looking at, this is interesting because we're looking at a lot of people that didn't even know each other, and they all had the same conclusion. Yeah. Many of these Sabbath keepers were lords and princes of high standing. All the counselors, this is another quote from Lamy, the history of mm -hmm. Sinaism. It says, all the counselors and great lords of the court who were already falling in with the doctrines of Wittenberg, of Osberg, Geneva, and Zurich, uh, they, uh, the head of the Sabbatarians, a people who did not keep Sunday but Saturday, and whose disciples took the name of Genoldus, all these and others declared for the opinions of Glandrat. So there are many, many groups that were keeping the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, 
uh, many of the Wallensees, whether called by that name, the Insabati or Wallensees or whatever, uh, observed the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment. Because of this, they were called by the significant name Insabati. And here's a quote from Wilkinson. Uh, Truth Triumphant, page 264. This is a great book. I recommend it for anyone. It's been maligned by the enemies of our church too, but it's a great book. Yeah. History. It says, um, speaking, it says, farmers or townsmen going to Saturday about their work were so impressed by the sight of groups of Christians assembling for worship on that day that they called them in Sabati. The term Sabbath was almost never applied to Sunday. Speaking of Constantine's Sunday law, Robert Cox writes, no evidence has been adduced that before the enactment of this law there was sabbatical observance of the Lord's Day, Sunday, in any part of Christendom. So, um, here's another one from Cox, The Literature of Sabbath Question, Volume 2, page 201. They hold that none of the ordinances of the church that have been introduced since Christ's ascension ought to be observed, being of no worth. The feasts, the fasts, the orders, the blessings, offices of the church, and the like, they utterly reject. And so, it says in Bohemia, as late as about 1500 AD, the Bohemians kept the Seventh-day Sabbath scrupulously and were called Sabbatarians, hmm. in that code. There's one last quote. This is an this is incredible quotation. You know, when we were at uh, Pra del Tor and we went up to the College of the Barbs mm -hmm. and we saw and, and Danielle Saban, she explained to us uh, the ordination ceremony. Check this out. This is an actual, this is from the Walden Seas of Italy by Kumba. And uh, this by is, Kumba. This is on, on page 288. And uh, it says, this is the way the ordination took place. When a barb is consecrated, the master assembles a few other barbs, and the candidate is required to swear as follows. Here's what he's supposed to say. You, and in the name, swear upon your faith to maintain, multiply, and increase our law, and to betray it to no one in the world. You promise in no wise to swear, to observe the Sabbath, and to do to no one that which you would not have them do unto you. Finally, that you believe in God who made heaven and earth. When the candidate had taken this oath, the great master handed him a cup, and at that moment he assigned a new name to him, saying, Henceforth thou shalt be called us. And they gave him mm -hmm. whatever the name. So I think there's plenty of evidence if your mind is open. If right. your mind is closed, if you want to believe the fabrications and falsifications and everything uh, that of the other books that are out there then that we have the freedom to do that but I think yeah. I think we can know that there are people that died because they kept the Sabbath and because they had the pure Word of God right. and so we know that that they brought up their young people to believe the scriptures it was it was very deeply embedded the whole Waldensian heresy if you want yeah. to call it that according to the, their right. enemies they they were basically a uh, sticking out like a sore thumb and people made fun of them, laughed at them. They even said they, they, that the Catholic leaders told their, their people, those Waldenses, they're weird. Their babies only have one eye right in the middle <laughs> yeah. of their head. And, and so... Hairy uh, throats and four yeah. rows of teeth. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, and so one of the one of the Dukes of Savoy, he actually said, can you bring bring some of those Waldensian children? I want to see those one-eyed uh -huh. monsters. And and uh, and they brought some children. He says, "I've never seen such beautiful children in my life. They didn't have one eye. They were beautiful yeah. children." They, they found out it was propaganda, huh? Yeah, I found out <laughs> it was propaganda, and so, but they were criticized severely. And so, I think that anybody that sticks up for truth, even today, will be will be made fun of, will be criticized, will be called legalists, yeah. will be called uh, fanatics. Yeah, the voodoo. They were called. That's where we get the word voodoo. They they connected it to demon worship and stuff yeah. and it's just it's horrible. The Boudoir actually came from the valleys, you know, they yeah, came from the valleys. The valley, but they turn into a bad byword. Yeah. You know. Like the Huguenots that they they had to worship at night in the woods and so they call them like the boogeyman. You yeah, know, the, the boogeyman. It yeah. was a derogatory term and so the So the uh, Huguenots was a derogatory term but so basically here we are uh, where, where this all took place and I think the, the, the bottom line is we certainly don't want to criticize our Waldensian friends for what they did because if we went through what they went through, yeah. uh, we probably would have been a lot less faithful than they were. And they were tired, they were worn out, many of them had been killed, their, their uh, scriptures had been, uh, most of their writings had been destroyed, although fortunately 
uh, they, we have quite a few of their original records that are still available in the Bodleian Library in, mm -hmm. in uh, England. So Ron, give us a little history of antiquity of the Walden season and what that applies to us uh, in these last days. So I'd like to just read a, a code here. And uh, this is from the Israel of the Alps, which is a complete history of the Walden Seas of Piedmont. And uh, this is, these are old, uh, older uh, uh, books. This is from, put back in the, uh, 1875. Hmm. But on page 29 here, Israel of the Alps by Houston, he says, thus was the primitive church preserved in the Alps to the very period of the Reformation, the boudoir or the chain which unites the Reformed churches with the first disciples of our Savior. It is in vain that popery, renegade from evangelical verities, has a thousand times sought to break this chain. It resists all our efforts. Empires have crumbled, dynasties have fallen, but this chain of scriptural testimony has not been broken because its strength is not from men, but from God. Wow. Isn't that incredible That's quotation? Beautiful. And And just showing the antiquity of them. And so there's another another quotation here. This is interesting. This is a, a, a book by Alex. Uh, it's called uh, Remarks Upon Ecclesiastical History of Ancient Churches in Piedmont. And this is from 1830, uh, 21. And uh, a lot of the, this is especially hated. This book is not really well loved by the people that don't like the Walden Seas. Right. They, don't, they don't like this book either. And most of these books they don't like, yeah. So anyway, on page four, <clears throat> he says, uh, it is hard to determine whether it was in the first century that these apostolical men planted the Christian religion in Milan, mm -hmm. in northwestern Italy, and the diocese thereunto into belonging, or whether it were done in the second century. Mm -hmm. So he's already showing the antiquity, and, and he's right. a very big authority if, among Protestants in mm -hmm. these. So, and on page 193, uh, there's an interesting uh, quotation. Uh, there was a turncoat among oh, yeah. the Waldensian pastors. Yeah, hey, you talked about that in the document. Yeah, yeah. and his yeah. name was Renaria Sacco. He was a papal persecutor and an officer in the Inquisition, but yeah. he used to be a pastor. He was a Waldensian yeah. pastor who yeah. actually turned against them. And uh, he, he wrote a, a, a book, a treaty against them, and he explained the early origin of the Waldenses. Wow. So here he was a Waldensian pastor, now he became an inquisitor, and now he's going to tell us, now that he's a Catholic inquisitor, he's going to tell us why they're, the, they're, they're so old. He said that, um, that they were, um, first of all it says here, we're on page 192, wherefore that I may once for all clear this matter, I say first that it is absolutely false that these churches were ever founded by Peter Waldo. Let them show us any author of that time who asserts that Peter Waldo ever preached in the Diocese of Italy wow. or that he founded any church there. Let them produce any sure tradition of that people, referring the original of their churches to Peter Waldo. Those who wrote at that time do not tell us anything like this, no more than they who lived thereafter. Wherefore we must needs conclude it's a pure forgery to look wow. upon Waldo as the person who first brought the Reformation in Italy we now find there. So then he says over here, uh, it says, uh, we have this confession of Renarius, an inquisitor, and uh, he, he, uh, he said, the heresy of those he calls boudoir, or poor people of lions of great antiquity, among all sects, sex, says he, that either are or have been, there is none more dangerous to the church than that of the Leonist. Hmm. Now, I gotta get real quickly. Go to the Leonists. Comes from Peter. Uh, comes from uh, Vigilantius. Leo. Right. Leo. That's clear back. We already mentioned him. Clear back in the in the fifth century, uh, the fourth and in, in, in fifth centuries. And he he came from a town of Leon, L Y O N, mm -hmm. pronounced Leo. Right. And he was called Vigilantius Leo. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Waldenses for many years hundreds of years were called Leonists because they followed after Vigilantius. Mm -hmm. The truth, like like we believe it, mm -hmm. we have to be careful and make sure that, that we don't compromise, that, that we communicate with them and, and make sure that we follow the Bible and the Bible only. Yeah. And that's what this motto is right here, the Bible and the Bible only. Yeah. And it was only faith. Yeah. 
faith yeah. in the Word of God. Yeah. And, so uh, let's get through that. Yeah. So this is a very special place, and I'm really very blessed to be here with both oh, of you. Oh, yeah. This yeah. Is, and when we realize that we're facing some of the same issues right now that they faced, and it's going to get worse, we believe, before mm -hmm. Jesus comes, we need to really hold on to these, these concepts mm -hmm. that they have. All right, well, let's go look around a little bit. Let's do yeah. it. Let's go. El resto del 1500 y todo el 1600 fueron tiempos de grandísimo sufrimiento. And the rest of the 1500s and all the 1600s there was a lot of suffering and pain mm -hmm. of the white man. Y la lectura que puedo hacer personalmente es que cuando nos exponemos al mundo y nos declaramos de la parte de Cristo, el mundo va a ser muy feroz. El, el, el enemigo de nuestras almas se va a, a, a volcar para destruirnos en modo muy fuerte. My, my take on this is that when we decide to follow Jesus, mm -hmm. the world will attack us like yeah. never before. That's right. And, this, and Satan himself will do all that he can to destroy us and undo what has been done. Well, this has been very interesting um, spending time with you this week. Ha sido muy interesante y provechoso el pasar tiempo juntos. My, my prayer is that God um, soon will raise, and I believe right now, He's raising an army. Mi oración y mi deseo, y yo sé que está pasando el día, Dios está levantando un ejército mundial. Those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Aquellos que guardan los mandamientos de Jesús, o de Dios, y tienen la fe. We are told that in the end times that God will take the wheel into his own hands. And that he's going to use humble instruments to do this work. And he will raise people from every denomination to stand for truth. And they'll unite with the remnant church and we'll be soon going home. So brother Estefan, we will be praying for you. May God bless you. God bless you, Father. Now at the very end of this chapter of Revelation 12 with the woman in the wilderness, it actually applies to our time also. In the very last verse, it says something very interesting to us. And it says, and the dragon or Satan was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we know the testimony of Jesus according to Revelation 19.10 is a spirit of prophecy. So God's people in the end times are going to be under attack again by the papacy. And it's going to be our turn to follow the example of the Waldenses and how they live their lives and to go back to primitive godliness. This is what God is wanting, primitive godliness in these last days. May God help us to be faithful and true even unto the very end of time. I hope this program has been a blessing to you. It's been a blessing to me. It puts more fire in my heart to be faithful to God. I hope that you and I will both be faithful and that we will both be able to see each other in the kingdom of God very soon. May God bless you and keep you in the palm of his hands. <laughs>